for everyone out there who's ever wondered, can you game on an NVIDIA Tesla card? Well, now I've done it. I hope that saves you the trouble. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff, and we are at the end of a journey, at least when it comes to these NVIDIA Grid Series cards, as I have finally benchmarked the NVIDIA Tesla M60 in gaming performance. So what do you say we get the final results out of the way right off the bat here? Let's just say I'm really happy the Intel i9-10900K still comes with integrated graphics on board. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to find a worse price to performance solution when it came to gaming than the Tesla M60s. Now that I've got that out of my system, let's go over how I tested these cards, what was involved in the setup, and what the results actually are. For those who didn't watch the build video, shame on you, but each one of these is an NVIDIA Tesla M60, and they are server compute graphics cards with no video outputs on board. The Tesla M60 was first released in August of 2015, making them exactly five years old this month. Each card features a pair of GM204 graphics processors, otherwise known as the Maxwell processors that powered the GTX 980. Each GPU on these cards has 2048 CUDA cores and 8GB of dedicated GDDR5. The Tesla M60 has a 300 watt TDP for the card, however that is hard capped at just 150 watts per GPU core, and we'll get into that in a little more detail here in just a minute. As for the rest of this system, it's got an AMD EPYC 7601 32 core 64 thread processor at 2.2 GHz and a Super Micro H11 SSL motherboard. That's hooked up to 8 channels of DDR4 2133 ECC registered memory, 64GB in total. For storage, it's rocking a 1TB Fire CUDA 510 NVMe drive and a pair of 1.92TB Iron Wolf 110 SSDs from Seagate. And finally, keeping this thing fed with watts is 1600 of them courtesy of EVGA in the Supernova T2. And now, on to the setup, and how do you actually game on an NVIDIA Tesla M60? This system is running VMware ESXi 6.7, along with an NVIDIA host driver that allows VMware to divvy up the GPU power to different virtual machines. Now this is a completely different solution and completely unrelated to PCI Express pass-through, that is passing through one graphics card to one virtual machine. Although, thank you to everyone who suggested I reach out to either Linus or Wendell, or just try Unraid, yo. It doesn't work like that. Rather, through proprietary NVIDIA drivers, VMware is able to divvy up a graphics card's power to up to 16 individual virtual machines per GPU core. That's 32 virtual machines per card, each of them with its own dedicated CUDA cores and connected video memory. The solution is called GRID, or vGPU, and is only available on NVIDIA GRID or NVIDIA Tesla-based GPUs. It is not available on their other lines of cards, such as GeForce, Titan, or even Quadro. When NVIDIA first introduced this technology in the Grid K1 and Grid K2 cards, which, by the way, these are why I started on this whole endeavor, the technology was free. You simply bought the card, installed the drivers, and then ran whatever GPUs you wanted on whatever virtual machines you wanted to use them on. However, that free period was kind of short-lived, as by the very next generation of cards, which you can see right inside of there, NVIDIA started charging licensing to use Grid technology. So not only did you have to fork out $6,000 for a single Tesla M60, but you had to pay upwards of $250 per concurrent user to use these graphics cards inside of a virtual environment. There's also some perpetual licenses available that run up to about $450 per concurrent user. So if you were gonna license for more than one year, that might've been the better way to go. However, better is kind of a relative term here. Now, NVIDIA is not the only guilty party to this whole situation, as both VMware and Zen both locked this feature behind paywalls as well. In the case of Zen, it's simply just not available on their free versions anymore, which I guess is pretty understandable. VMware, though, went one step further. Not only do you need an enterprise license for ESXi, you also need a license to vCenter, which is VMware's full-blown data center and clustering management system for VMware installations. A vSphere Enterprise Plus license will run you about $3,600 for a single server. Add in vCenter to that, and you're looking at an additional $6,200. Add in a Tesla M60 for about $6,000, and you're looking at a grand total of $15,769 to run one server, one license for vCenter, Center and one Tesla M60 card. Oh, don't forget that $250 per concurrent user license that NVIDIA tax on. So what do we get for all of our additional licensing fees inside of vCenter for our particular use case? Well, we get the menu option to add a shared PCI Express device. And that's pretty much it. Now mind you, the standard version of ESXi does include a menu option for PCI Express pass-through, as all of this is just a text change inside the configuration file for each virtual machine. 
but they decided to make the menu option of shared PCI Express completely different than the PCI Express pass-through, that if you assign a graphics card using vCenter, and then you go back to vSphere and you try to edit that menu option, it actually shows up as a completely different device and doesn't let you change the parameters, even though you have vCenter fully installed and enabled. Anyway, the menu options here pretty much boil down to assigning video memory from your graphics card over to your virtual machine, starting at 512 megabytes and going all the way up to eight gigabytes, or the full allocation for one of the GPU cores on the Tesla M60. Assigning a vGPU can only be done to a virtual machine after you've completed the Windows install, and that Windows install is accessible through another remote client, either through RDP or VNC or some other method, as once you install the vGPU, you lose the ability to use the onboard SVGA that is baked into the virtual machine, so the built-in web client, either in vCenter or vSphere, will no longer function. Is everyone with me through this convoluted mess so far? Good. So now I have four Windows 10 virtual machines which have vGPUs assigned to them through vCenter and I've logged into each of these virtual machines, installed the proprietary NVIDIA drivers and connected those NVIDIA drivers up to my NVIDIA license server which I also had to install and then installed Parsec Gaming so I have remote access to these using full graphics acceleration. Now each of my four Windows 10 VMs has 2048 CUDA cores and 8 gigabytes of GDDR5. Now, given those numbers, and given the fact that the Tesla M60s have a boost clock of 1176 megahertz, we should be expecting some pretty decent performance here. I mean, it has the same number of CUDA cores as the GTX 980, and is only about 40 megahertz slower, with the 980 being at 1216 megahertz. Well, let's get into the benchmarks. Before I give you the numbers, I am going to give a little disclaimer here as well. Number one, I was running the other three virtual machines on this box inside of Unigen Heaven Loop, to give them a full load and simulate running four gamers at the same time. There's other a minor note on the NVIDIA drivers. When you run a vGPU inside of VMware, it forces vSync to be on, so the max frame rate you will ever see inside of a game is 60 FPS. So starting with our synthetics in 3D Mark Firestrike, where the Tesla M60 virtual GPU scored a graphics score of 10,930. Now that sounds pretty good until I give you a comparison point. This one being the $40 RX 470 that I bought off Taobao last year, which picked up an 11,597. Not a great starting point for our Tesla M60, seeing as how it's losing to a three-year-old sub $200 graphics card. 3D Mark Time Spy is at least a little bit closer, with the Tesla M60 scoring a 3445 in graphics and the RX 470 scoring a 3488, or a difference of only about 1.5%. Moving into our gaming results, and we've got some not so great showings for the Tesla M60, and well, I'll be perfectly honest, pretty much all of this is not a great showing for the Tesla M60, starting with Doom Eternal. We did manage that full 60 FPS on average with 1% lows of 29 FPS and a 0.1% low of just 23, and overall this experience was very playable and really among the best that I tested. Now the gaming client that I've been using for all of this testing, Parsec Gaming, to its credit, does a wonderful job at providing pretty low latency gaming. Now, to be clear, I'm still very aware that I'm playing on a remote client, being that there's a lot of MPEG compression in certain areas, even with a local LAN connection, and the latency is good enough to be very enjoyable, however noticeable in some areas, especially in a Twitch shooter like Doom or CSGO. Speaking of CSGO, it also picked up a 60 FPS average with a 1% low of 27 and a 0.1% low, unfortunately, all the way down to 15. Now, as far as the gaming experience, that is pretty forgivable given that we're on a remote system. However, these benchmarks were recorded locally on the virtual machine, which means this graphics card has a 0.1% low of 15 FPS in CSGO at 1080 high settings. Not necessarily the most redeeming of qualities. Unfortunately, Project Cars 2 was the only other game in my test suite to average 60 FPS, which 60 FPS should be pretty easily attainable for all of these games, given that I really didn't hammer the graphics settings too hard. But here we are. So Project Cars 2, average of 60 FPS, a 1% low of 30.5, and a 0.1% low again all the way down to 15. And now we can start getting into some of the more disappointing benchmark results, starting with the original Crisis from 2007, because I wanted to know if these cards could run Crisis. And in fact, they can, with an average of 51 FPS. The virtual Tesla M60 managed a 1% low of 29 and a 0.1% low of 21. So still very playable, however, very disappointing for a 13-year-old game on a graphics card that is eight years newer than it and was supposedly based on the flagship of that day. 
Hellblade, Sinua's Sacrifice, picked up a 44 FPS on average to go along with a 1% low of 18 and a 0.1% low of just 8.2. So yeah, now we're getting into the single digit 0.1% lows and averages that don't even approach the 50s, let alone 60 FPS. And finally, GTA V, which had an average frame rate of 50, but a 1% low of 11 and a 0.1% low of 0.3. And yes, unfortunately that was a legit 0.3.1% low, as this game was stuttery as all hell. So, the server is finally working and finally plays games, in fact up to four of them at the same time. But remember back to last week when I was benchmarking Crisis, and I said I got an average of 60 FPS in Crisis, and it was only utilizing about 40% of one of the GPU cores. So in theory I could split that core in two and play up to eight instances of Crisis on this one machine. And in fact, that was my plan going into early this week. But remember all the way back to the beginning of this video, where I mentioned the 300 watt TDP for the Tesla M60s, including the 150 watt hard cap for each individual GPU core. While the GPU core was only being utilized to about 40% of its max, it was still drawing between 90 and 100 watts to power one instance of Crisis, meaning that even if I split that one GPU core into two, I've now run into a GPU power limit. So by trying to run multiple gaming machines at the same time, I introduced a couple of unintended consequences. Number one, I started frame throttling, and pretty darn hard. Number two, because the games were now taking up 100% of the utilization of the GPU, I now had nothing left over for the video encoding, which is kind of important when you're playing on a remote machine. So even if I were able to hack these cards and introduce more wattage to the GPUs, I'm still going to be left with the fact that 100% of the GPU is being utilized to render the game and there's nothing left available to push those frames over to Parsec. So can you game on an NVIDIA Tesla M60? Yes. By modern standards, it's a pretty terrible experience though. And you're limited to two instances for a single graphics card, meaning that each GPU has to render its own individual game and take care of its own video encoding and send that to your remote client. Overall, totally not worth it for the $3,000 asking price currently of an NVIDIA Tesla M60. But let's say you have an NVIDIA Tesla M60 just laying around. Should you utilize it then? Well, you still have to go through all of the licensing and all of the overhead to get the system to run. This is what was required to get 60 FPS in Doom Eternal, running virtually. You still have to have an ESXi Enterprise license and a vCenter license so you can actually assign your virtual GPU profile over to a virtual machine. On top of that, you still need to run an NVIDIA license server and pay NVIDIA for licensing based on concurrent users that you have assigned to your virtual GPUs. Which, by the way, I have a totally valid NVIDIA license right now and I still ran into licensing issues with this system. Every time a virtual machine with a vGPU profile assigned to it boots up, it has to contact your local NVIDIA license server to verify it still has a valid license. If the VM can't get in contact with the license server, or let's just say Java decides to crash on the license server, it'll just default down to the lowest tier your grid card can offer, or 1 16th of your GPU power. You know, there's really nothing quite like trying to run Unigen Heaven at 1080p on 128 CUDA cores. Anyway, does it work? Sure. Should you do it? <laughs> no. This system was a lot of fun to get together and get it working properly. However, considering the costs involved, I can't fathom a single use case where this is a viable solution. Especially considering just a couple of years ago where we were at memory and core count pricing, this would have been an astronomically expensive solution to dole out remotely to your users to run CAD or video editing. I'm sure someone has ideas, and if you've ever used one of these in an enterprise environment, let me know down in the comments below because I kind of want to investigate some of these. But for today, I think that's pretty much going to put a lid on gaming with NVIDIA Grid. However, I've auspiciously left out one other piece of technology that I'm really excited to start taking a look at. In the meantime, if you guys like this video, make sure to hit that thumbs up button and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing to keep up with my daily shenanigans. And if you like the content you see and want to help support what I do, consider joining the Patreon. Minimum donation of just $1 a month, however more is certainly appreciated. And you'll get exclusive access to my Discord server, where you can chat with myself pretty much any time of day. Follow the Patreon link down in the video description to learn more. That's going to do it for me in this one, guys. Thank you all so much for watching, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, all.
Beer for today is Tasty from 21st Amendment Brewery in, and of course I forgot, uh, San, San Leandro, California. It is a 6.8% IPA with 70 IBU. I just hope I don't get demonetized for the can art on this one. The uh, Ben Franklin starring in American Beauty with uh, hops falling on him instead of rose petals. Very hoppy on the nose. Not really a, a citrus hop. Uh, much more of a, I don't want to call it grassy either, but much more plant herbal kind of hoppiness. Yeah, and that carries straight through to the flavor on this one. Um, that's pretty solid. I like that. I will say, this is pretty tasty. However, overall, it is a pretty nondescript IPA. It's a hop flavor of some kind that isn't really wet, but isn't really dry. It's not really oily, but it's not really refreshing and crisp. Uh, it's kind of right there in the middle. Um, same thing with the hop profile. It's not citrusy, it's not grassy, it's not dank. It's maybe a little botanical and kind of floral, uh, a little bit of a, a flower kind of uh, taste to it but there's nothing really that's overriding it. When you taste it, you taste an IPA, and it's a pretty darn good one. But there's nothing that stands out as unique about this particular beer. There's nothing even uniquely discerning about this particular beer as it's hops. It's not clear, but it's not hazy either. It's, you know, it's just kind of, it's an IPA. It's exactly what it says it is. Um, it's quite good, but at the same time, it's also quite forgettable. If I had to compare it to something, this is a slightly boozier all-day IPA from Founders. And if you like kind of that session ale, you know, just generic tasting IPA, which I really do like the all-day IPA, uh, this is a 7% version of that. Hard to go wrong. Well, hi, buddy. How are you? <laughs> hi. Are you gonna come chill? No, I'm just gonna walk on everything. Yeah. Hi. 